everyone who's just joined us. We're glad you're here. People are throwing their lunch trash away so they can get in here. Well, that's the beauty of this, right? You get to uh, you get to eat at your desk, get to participate, and no one knows that you're having the tuna sandwich. So as we said earlier, if you missed it, you can put your questions uh, throughout the webinar into the chat or in the Q&A feature. Either, either place will work for us. We'll be checking them and we'll be, um, we'll be delivering those to, uh, to Dallin as he goes through and, and talks to everyone. And we do want this to be a two-way communication for all everybody that's on here. Um, Dallin's gonna share some information about him and who he is. But this is also an opportunity for him to get to meet you and get to hear your concerns and maybe some questions that you have. So please don't be shy about that. This is absolutely intended to be a two-way conversation. Yeah, I have a blank piece of paper here to write down all the desperate advice. And if it's blank at the end, then we got a problem. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, is Amy Shields on? Are you see her? Uh, I believe so. She is, yes. All right. She she passed up meeting me in person because I'm in Pennsylvania. And she passed up meeting me in person. Said, "Oh, I'll just see you online." <laughs> Thanks, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> For those who don't know, I'm in Pennsylvania at the Inspector Training School. I've been visiting some members and I'm going to do some more member visits. And I'm sure if you want to host Alan at your place and have a visit, you could just. Email him or call him. So. All right. Well, we're just a tad after or one minute after. Um, I think we'll probably go ahead and get things started again. Please, please, please put your questions in the chat or the Q&A feature. Okay. And with that, I'm going to go dark and silent and I'm going to, I'm going to let, uh, Dallin uh, do his thing. And I guess we should just quickly say, if you don't know, because we've been working with him for several weeks now, um, Dallin Brooks did come on June the 13th. Um, he's been with us, I guess, uh, a month, a month to the day. Um, and we are happy that he is here. Um, he is acclimating to Memphis and to the association. And with that, we're gonna turn it over to Dallin and we'll be monitoring your questions, okay? Okay. One month to the day, that means I've got everything learned already. So I know everything there is to know about hardwoods, the business, the grades. In fact, I was just out there correcting the grading students. I'm like, no, 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 that's not FAS. That's one common. But that didn't really help them. <laughs> so I really appreciate the chance to get in front of everybody. And I really, that was one of the first things I asked Renee is, can I have a chance to talk to everybody? Cause I know I've met some of the board members and I appreciate some of the board members getting back on here and they are gonna see some uh, details that I shared with them before, but I just wanted to get out beyond the board members and give everybody a chance to get to know me a little bit, to share some of my background so that we can relate because I really think it's important for us to have a common ground. And I think it's important for us as we go forward as the NHLA to continue to uh, build on common ground. You know, that's where we face nowadays is the, a lot of polarization and yet there's still a lot of common ground. And so going back to our strong roots and global reach, we need to continue to build on that common ground. My contact information is there at the bottom of the slide. It's on the last slide too, but feel free to write it down, send me a text or give me a call anytime. Uh, even in the middle of the night, I might not respond, but I've got seven kids, so there's a good chance I do because I might be up taking care of somebody or waiting for some teenager to come home, that wayward teen, always hoping for them to uh, get home in a timely manner. So I'm just going to get into it right now and give you a little bit of background on me and uh, tell you a little bit about myself. First of all, I really have to say this, and I will slow down because I do talk really fast when I get excited. I love association work. Okay, and John's got to remind me to slow down a couple of times on this because I get talking fast when I love something. I will. I forgot. I promised you I would do that. So I need to <laughs> David Mayfield, if he can figure out how to use the computer, will be on here saying slow down. So we'll see if he makes it. Uh, I worked for associations before. 
FP Innovations, formerly known as Foreign Tech, I worked in their marketing and economics department and conducted contractor and homeowner surveys where we actually talked about their preferences for wood products, including hardwoods. And it was a great experience for me to really learn how associations work and the importance of associations and working together. I also worked for the Western Wood Preservers Institute for the last 10 years. So that's where I'm coming from. I've been there uh, revitalizing the preserved wood side of the industry, including hardwoods for ties. So I've got exposure from that side of the industrial products. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And really, I feel my role is to help the board make hard decisions to improve your business. That is what an executive director does. I'm not making the decisions. I just had an executive committee call here an hour ago to go over things. And I proposed a couple of things and they said, yeah, think about this a little bit more. And that's exactly what it is. It's okay, come back, think about it more and work together to make those decisions together. And so I feel like that's the role of the executive director and I'm looking forward to taking on that role. That's really what I love. But here's the other things that I love, family, forests, my faith, and a little bit of fun. And I'm just gonna give you a little bit of rundown to each of these because I think, again, we have common beliefs and common ground that are very enjoyable and things that are worth knowing about. And so I figured giving you a little bit of history about myself will help us relate and connect. And I really hope to learn more about each of you and participate with you. Get to know your things that you enjoy. So yes, my wife Sarai and I have seven children and our oldest is 22 and just graduated from nursing and our youngest is three and just graduated from diapers. And that's a good, <laughs> I hope you're laughing. Well, my wife and I sometimes are crying about it, but yes, uh, it is a good stage of life to be in. They can help each other out, but not as much as you wish. Uh, it's always bittersweet as it is with all ages of life and a lot of good things. My wife has one brother and he's nine years older than her. So she always wanted to have buddy babies. So when we did our family, we always made sure that we did them in groups so that nobody would ever be left out. That's my family. The other thing I should say about my family, actually just going back briefly, is that I grew up, I have uh, nine siblings, grew up on a hunting and fishing territory in northern British Columbia and southern Alberta, and my brothers are my best friends, much to my mom's chagrin, and I should say this as just a way of showing how personal I am, that, you know, things really are emotional right now because my mother just passed away yesterday. She had prostate cancer and she was diagnosed with that six weeks ago. And they told us three to six months and I spent a week with her just before I moved here to Memphis and she passed away yesterday at 6.30. Uh, I'm gonna leave straight from here tomorrow and head off to see my family and be with them for the weekend. But family really is the most important thing. And my mother's number one thing she said with a big family was a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. She would never uh, answer anything harshly. She was the most kind of wonderful woman ever there was. On a more fun note, it's really about the forests. I grew up in the forest. I grew up hunting and fishing my entire life. That is a bull moose there. It's not the first one I shot and it's not the last one I shot because I guide moose hunters with my brothers every year. And uh, more often than not, even these big uh, Southern guys that come up with the, the big game hunters or these Pennsylvania guys, I get them. They've been buck hunting for a long time. And they've seen the 12 point buck and they'll sit there and brag to me about how many deer they've shot. And they see that big bull moose in the crosshairs and they start to shake and it shakes and it shakes and it's really hard to hit that bull moose when it's shaking so bad. And that's why I'm there. I'm the insurance. So I uh, really love the forest, spent my time growing up there, hunting and fishing and with a chainsaw. I never live without a chance. I never go anywhere without a chance on the woods up there because you will never get back because the trees are falling around behind you. This is the view across the lake. We have a cabin up there in the lake in the woods it's called Crystal Lake. And I was up there for Christmas. I also love wood so much, I got two degrees in it from the University of British Columbia, studying wood products processing, where I studied basically wood engineering and hands-on uh, courses, teaching me how to use wood, understand all the benefits of wood and things like that, as well as then a master's from Forest and Society, 
focusing on small rural communities and the importance of commodities and value added commodities. And in particular, I chose the value added commodity of thermal modification as a way of promoting uh, small rural communities into higher value products, such as the small community I grew up in in Vanderhoof, British Columbia, needing to have thermal modification to cover the blue stain on all their radio, uh, mountain pine beetle killed wood and got into thermal modification from that. We'll talk a little bit more about that. My faith, I just got to be honest and say I have a firm faith in, in Jesus Christ and I love to sing, but there is not a worse singer in the world than me. In fact, I was asked to do a solo specifically in front of a, of a large audience because they had been a, at the Orpheum Theater in Vancouver. And the reason for that, this is not a picture of the Orpheum. The, the reason they did that is because they had somebody sing so badly that they wanted to recreate it. And so they asked me to sing and didn't tell me why. <laughs> so sang in front of the large audience as the monotone person in the group for a comedy skit. But this is actually the tabernacle uh, in Salt Lake City, the Mormon Tabernacle. I'm not in the choir, but I sang there once in a choir, and it was really a great experience for me getting to be in that experience and share it. I also just like to share this just because I get offered drinks all the time because I'm a cheap date. Uh, we spend more money on food and less on alcohol, so it's a, a great thing to uh, invite me out to dinner sometime when I come visit your plant. Designated driver. This is actually a, a choir seat that I saw when I was in Venice with my wife just a couple months ago. And it's a beautiful Catholic church with those choir seats. And I tell you, I wanted to sit in those seats so badly, so badly. But the beautiful hardwood there was just amazing. The dedication to the details. If you can just look at that picture forever, you just fall in love with it. Like, it, how does that not increase your faith? <laughs> so it's just a great picture. I just thought I'd share that. Really. I take my faith to the next level in terms of, I find it is important to inspire me to be better. And I feel like that's what helps me at the NHLA and other jobs is because I write in a journal every day. It really gives me the impetus to go out there and to try to be better each day. What can I improve on? What have I done better? And how can I give back to others? So for instance, I served a mission in Eugene, Oregon, and I was a Canadian. So this is the best foreign mission there was uh, going around with uh, good food, hot showers. So a lot better than going to those third world countries. I also do a lot of volunteering with the Boy Scouts organization. I love to hike Boy Scouts. If there's anything that a Boy Scout needs to learn, it's to hike beyond the ability you think you can go. And there's a great reward to that. My oldest son, Chaz, just got his Eagle Scout. So very excited for that. But my real passion, my real fun is climbing mountains. This is the top of Mount Hood in... Oregon. In the background, you can see three other mountains there. That's Mount Rainier, Mount Adams, and Mount St. Helens, which have been the summit of all those mountains too. And it's a lot of fun to get to the top of a mountain and to look out. I also do a lot of hiking in forests. And I hiked when I was a teenager, 350 kilometers across British Columbia in 16 days. And I literally, if you look at those, that background picture, I literally took um, right from my back elbow there, I'm in the green, there's Mount St. Helens. And then over to the farthest mountain is Mount Adams. So Mount Rainier is farther back in the background. And I hiked the Boy Scouts up Mount St. Helens, 70 miles over to Mount Adams and up Mount Adams in one week. And they all complained. And then afterwards said that was the best thing they've ever done in their life. So that's not relaxing, that's hard work, but I think it's important for that lesson to be learned. But I like to relax in the cabin in the woods. I don't like to sleep on the ground. It's never comfortable. There's always a, a root or a rock underneath your air mattress that get, somehow gets a hole in it and becomes flat. So I'm much more of a cabin person, but uh, that's what I like to do. Hey, Dallin, somebody wants to know specifically, where are you from in Canada? Oh, I was born just outside of Waterton National Park in Southern Alberta and raised there. My father had a hunting lodge there. And then another hunting lodge up in northern British Columbia, just outside of Prince George, BC, and about two hours northwest of that. And I've lived in Vancouver, British Columbia for about 15 years, and then down to Vancouver, Washington for the last 10 years while I ran the Western Wood Preserves Institute. So 
But here's the good news for you that you might not have known about me is that I actually attended the NHLA convention 10 years ago, back in 2000, or 12 years ago, back in 2010 and 2011. I got an article in the Hardwood Matters magazine as I talked about thermal modification because early on when I was looking at it for blue stain pine, I realized how important it would be for the hardwood industry. And actually I've always said to everybody that's ever asked me that I think there's more potential for thermal modification in hardwoods than there ever will be in the softwood industry just because of the stability and the color change. I built small thermal modification units. I built one in Quebec, I built one in Minnesota, one in British Columbia and used those systems to help advance the industry back before I took over as the Wood Preservers Institute. So I really understand thermal modification. If you ever want an independent voice on thermal modification, give me a call because I can tell you the ups and downs, the ins and outs of thermal modification. I looked at all the different technologies and shared that with everybody. So very happy to talk thermal modification with any members who are interested in it as a non-sales pitch, gives you the, the lowdown of what it's really like and, and how it really handles. I have tons of samples in my office as the staff can all attest to my furniture showed up on Friday. So I've been sleeping on an air mattress for the last two weeks in Memphis. My furniture showed up on Friday. And the first thing I did is unpack all my wood samples in the office and set them up. So uh, lots of thermal modification of wood samples there. Really what I think you need to know in terms of coming to the NHLA is I do have experience as an executive director for a regional association. And that is the Western Wood Preservers Institute. The reason I think that's so critical is because I understand working with the nationals, I understand working with the regionals, and I understand the importance of associations to membership and getting different things. I really focused a couple of things on the wood preservers, and I really wanted to share it with you because I think we're going to have to look at it here as we continue to tell our story for the hardwood industry is the importance of words and helping people make connections to what we do. And I'll give you a great example because we used to be the treated wood industry. And we've really pushed hard to switch over to the preserved wood industry. You know, you're treated for things like cancer. You know, you, you treat warts. You, you, everything you treat is bad, but you preserve the forest, right? You, the best preserves to eat are your grandma's old preserves, right? The best jams or anything like that. You know, preserve is more positive. And so it's just a matter of saying, should we focus on the negative or should we focus on the positive? And we switched from treated to preserved. And we're trying throughout the industry to make that move more and more into the consumers and downstream so that they can have a more positive view of us. The other thing that we do is we talk about preservatives and we'd say, well, this is an industrial strength or this is a commercial grade or this is a, a heavy duty wood preservative. And when you think of industrial or commercial or heavy duty preservatives or pesticides, you're not thinking, oh, those are good. You're thinking, oh, those are really bad. Those are really toxic. But when we talk about those are infrastructure preservatives, it has a connotation of, oh, that's for safety, that's for sustainability, that's a positive thing. And so we switched away from using the term industrial and commercial and went to infrastructure. And those little words make a big impact on the whole perception of our industry when you talk about it. And so it's those types of things where we just need to sometimes be careful of the words we use and understand the words and what their meanings are. A great example of this is back in my thermal modification days, I was working with a company in Finland and there was a company in Finland who was thermally modifying wood and they wanted to name their wood Forever Wood. So that was their, that was their brand. They're going to call it Forever Wood. And the word for wood in Finnish is poo, P-U-U, -U, poo. And the word for forever is icky, I-K-K-I. -I. And so their brand as they tried to come across in North America was icky poo. Yeah, that bad, <laughs> right? So it's really important to make sure we use the right words and we have a good perspective on it. So I hope that as we're thinking about this and we go throughout our industry, if you have ideas of words that we can do to improve or should avoid, you know, let's discuss those words because I think it's important for us to always be thinking about the words we use to describe our industry so that we can get away from some of the past misperceptions that maybe stain our industry and people still think are relevant and aren't today. The other thing that I really did at WWPI for the last 10 years is create online content. And I'm just gonna be honest with you, we moved away from trade shows. A lot of people don't go to trade shows looking for the new latest and greatest. They go to trade shows to maintain customers, to see them and to do other things. When we were doing our trade shows, we were trying to get out to architects, engineers and 
to consumers, but we were spending a lot of money and not getting a very good return on investment. And so we decided to develop online content to reach those people because nowadays everybody Googles it. So if you want to know about preserved wood, you Google it. And so we developed online content and we developed smartphone apps. So if you actually go into your smartphone today, you can look up the, the tie grading guide and get all the details on how to grade wood ties right here on your phone and even see videos of how it's done and have a chance to look at it. So if you haven't ever checked that out, go ahead and to your app store and download the tie grading guide. The other thing that I think is critical for associations, and this is something I feel like has been lost across the, the wood industries. We've seen a number of our universities do less and less wood and forestry focus, and they've changed their names to schools of conservations and other things. And I really did a push to go back to new research and to engaging with the universities. And when we did that, we were able to come up with several ideas for improvements that actually brought cost savings back to members, where we looked at the retention zone and the assay and the amount of preservative we were putting in. And we did a little research study on it and were able to say, hey, yeah, we can do less preservative, which is better for the environment and more cost efficient for our businesses. And therefore we can improve efficiency and environmental benefits and save money and it didn't cost the industry a whole lot. And so that kind of connection really is strong. And I look forward to doing those types of things again as I go forward in the future. And that's really what I wanna to offer to the NHLA members and to each of you as a, as a passion that I really love what I do. And I'll get excited and talk loud and fast, but hopefully I can uh, communicate clearly how important it is to engage with you and to communicate with you I have three rules for meetings. I share this with the staff, I share it with everybody. And, and everybody that was at the board meeting had bacon for breakfast, except for Bucky, because we kept running out. We'll fix that problem for Bucky. But you never see the slam slide twice. You know, our issues never change. You've been coming to NHLA meetings for a lot of years. You're going to hear it from the Harvard Coalition. You're going to hear it about promotion. You're going to hear about networking. You're going to hear about clear cutting and other issues. You're going to hear about long eared bat and endangered species. Those issues never change. And that is true. But that doesn't mean we have to talk about them the same way, say the same thing again and again and again. We can talk about it differently. We can look at it from different perspectives. We can make sure that we're communicating clearly about it. And if nothing's changed, then we can say, we'll come back to that when something has changed. Uh, the other thing that I always think of when it comes to being an executive director is that we have to provide help direction, help provide direction. And to do that, we need to provide insight and comments. But I also know that people don't always comment and speak up on things. And so my rule is, if you don't comment, that means you agree with me. So what I say goes. Now, I did that for the Western Wood Preservers Institute, and it was amazing that everybody had opinions and comments. So I guess that just sort of shows how good my ideas are or aren't. <laughs> Here's the other thing. Again, this is your hard-earned money. And... I want to sh share with you the importance of your money. I understand the value of a dollar. I understand that this is money that would be spent on your business if it wasn't spent on the NHLA. And we appreciate that money. We want to make sure that you know that we spend that money wisely. And it will be focused very heavily on fiscal management of the NHLA as we continue to uh, rebuild and do things new and differently here. Things are always changing. We can't stop change, but we can make sure that we don't just change for the sake of change. And we can make sure that the changes that we make are for the best and for the long-term investment. The other thing is to collaborate with other associations. So if you're looking at this picture here, I am the, the good looking guy in the green. And that's Jeff Miller from the Tree to Wood Council uh, in the middle and Kevin Reagan from the Southern Pressure Treaters Association in the white. And he makes the white look good. And I don't mind the fact that he looks better than me, but I'm here to tell you, uh, Ray from IHLA or Amy Shields, we're going to we're gonna get some uh, parties going on. We're going to get the members involved when we have some of these good centennial celebrations and we're going to collaborate together and we're going to make the whole industry look good. That's our promise, that working together with other associations makes everybody look better because you didn't even notice that there's two people in the background, right? But that's the industry guys in the background. They're there. They appreciate what you do. That's Ken Laughlin. And he's got a smile on his face because he knows that his associations are doing a good job representing him and taking care of his needs. And I'm willing to do that. And I think the best thing I can do is listen. And I spent the first month right now listening to people, going in and asking questions from all the staff, from members, from the allied associations, and continuing to get feedback because that's really how you make good decisions. 
is analyze all the angles. I want to say this though, you know, NHLA and all the other allied associations, we function on a committee basis. If there's one thing I know about committees, it's that sometimes committees get a lot of criticism. I'm going to read you this quote from Robert Copeland. I don't read slides very often, but I want you to read this quote. If you want anything done in a committee, you should limit it to no more than three people, of which at least two should be absent. And while that's funny and that's true, we all know that, you know, that's a picture right next to it of my son falling as he came down off of a line when we were climbing the Grand Teton. And if it wasn't for the fact that there was a belayer below him to help ease his fall and somebody above him to warn, he could have seriously hurt himself falling into all those rocks below. So yes, committees of one can get things done, but oftentimes we need that safety net around them. And I really wanna hit that, right? Uh, committees need to work together. They are there for that safety net to make sure we don't go down the wrong direction. I always say this about associations. I say we have a lot of potential to do good or bad for the industry. And that's why we have a committee is to make sure that we're paying attention and we're prepared all the safety measures are in place. The other quote there that I think is really important is that one by Fred Allen that says, a committee is a group of the unprepared appointed by the unwilling to do the unnecessary. And there's a lot of truth to that. Committees don't get all the information. It's impossible to know everything about our industry and about everybody's circumstances and situations, but that's why you have a staff. That's why the NHLA is here. We are the ones to do the preparation we are the ones who are willing to do the work because this is our job. And we are the ones that understand how necessary each of these changes are to the good of the association. And so as members work by consensus, staff is there to prepare, recommend, support, and facilitate these discussions so that the members can make the right decisions by a consensus process. And that's really why we need the membership to participate, to join committees and don't just rubber stamp things, but actually participate and help us make sure that all the lines have been checked and everything is done right so that everybody is doing what is right and necessary for the good of the whole entire industry. You know, I always say this to people, what is the answer to most of the problems? And the, the question is, what questions are we trying to solve, right? Are we trying to solve environmental issues? Are we trying to solve social issues? Are we trying to solve other issues? Because the hardwood industry is a part of our daily lives for everybody. If it is from the railway tracks, all the way to the pallets that they're shipped on that got us our cell phones, right? This cell phone is here because of trains and pallets. It's also here because of paper and other products that packaged it. So, you know, sometimes we think about hardwood versus trees or versus softwood or engineered wood or even competition or other things like that. But it isn't really an either or, it's a wood and, or we can do this and we can still have this. You know, we're not giving up trees by having hardwoods. We aren't, it's not a this or that. It's really about the fact that they are compliments, not competition. And I really think that as we tell that story and we build on common grounds with others, we'll do a better job of helping people to understand why we use wood today and the how, hard, how come hardwoods matter. In fact, as you can sit there and look at this, it doesn't matter what you believe. I really think this is true, right? Nobody really goes on social media or other places sees an opposing point of view and just immediately changes their perspective. It doesn't happen. But what can happen is we can say, yeah, you might have a different opinion than I have. You might be coming from a different base than I have, but at some point there is common ground. And that's why I shared with you all the story about my family, because I really wanna find that common ground and start to build from there. And that common ground might just be the fact that, we, you know, you lived in a rural community and I lived in a rural community. Okay, then we can both talk about that or the urban. We're both young and we want to make sure that by the time we die, we've made the world a better place. Great, let's find, let's find that. What can we do? Now, whatever our background might be, we can find some common ground with the person next to us who might oppose what we're trying to do, but not understand why we do what we do. And it's important for us to tell that story. And I'm looking forward to doing that. You know, this is the picture from the top of Mount Hood looking down in the side view of Mount Hood. I bring this back up again, I showed you earlier, the view from it. This is looking to the south, so you can't see the other mountains, but it's showing you uh, the hogs back. Mount Hood is the number two most climbed mountain in the world. Mount Fuji is the highest and most climbed mountain in the world. 
And this year they've just started a new system where they're going to start charging permits because they've had to do so many mountain rescues on the Mount Hood because people thought it would be easy. It's you're so close. The ski lift takes you three quarters of the way there. And if you want, you can just climb it up in shorts and t-shirts and it looks really nice and warm in the day, but they don't understand how drastically things can change up on top of a mountain. You know, they don't understand the concerns for the Bershong that is right there in front of this climber coming up. You see that little crevasse, that little gap right there in front of them, how careful you have to maneuver around that. They don't realize the importance of the gear and proper equipment so that you can stay warm if you have to slow down or pause or something happens, things like that. And so really you have to know what you're doing before you start and you have to have the proper equipment. And it always helps to go with somebody who's done it before. And I'm saying this because I want to talk about the strategic plan because when I look at what the NHLA has done with the strategic plan and everything like that, it didn't really make it to the top. It really needs, we need to look at this again because we really need to have more buy-in from the members, from the staff and a more cohesive build up to action to make sure that we have all the right gear and equipment to do this. You know, the NHLA has lots of good information. We don't need to go back and start all over again. We don't need to build from the ground up. We've got a great foundation that's already been there. There's done surveys with, with recommendations and questions, core strategies, all these things. And I'm not looking to come back and start all over again. I'm looking to say, yes, we've got this now. We need to put it in, in a better perspective. We need to look at it. We need to do a little bit more preparation as we come out to the members and then build up to action and actually have action and committee assignments that come from it. Because that's what gets you to the top of the mountain. The smartest guy is at the top of the mountain when the sun rises. Because if you're at the top of the mountain as the sun rises, that's when everything's the coldest. It doesn't get any colder from there. It starts to warm up. And that means everything's solid. You're on good foundation and your ice axe and everything will hold to the snow before it starts to become more avalanche prone. So it's really about getting up at the right time. But getting up is only halfway. We really at the NHLA need to focus on what our core beliefs and needs are. And that, of course, comes back to inspection services and the grading rules, right? And that's really what we need to do. We need to make sure that the customers, like the active members, have a voice and don't lose that voice, but also understand how important the supporting members are for making sure that that voice is heard and that voice is able to meet together in conventions and other places to find out what they need to know. You know, grading really is the critical things. Associations have a lot of work, and there's a lot of con uh, words on this slide, but I guess what I want to bring home is the fact that associations are here because there isn't always a great return on every investment. Promotion, uh, grading rules, inspection training school, you know, it's hard to find that return on investment, but that's what we're here for because we pool together everybody's resources so that we can do it on a level and a scale that does provide that. And in order to do that pooling, we need to have participation from anybody. And as we participate more together, we increase the value of the NHLA more. And as we increase the value of the NHLA more, more people want to participate. And so it really does become a better cycle. And it helps us get off the mountain. It helps us take our plans and actually put them into action so that when we're coming down, we're doing it safely. My wife always says to me when I go climbing a mountain, getting to the summit is optional. Getting home is not. And that's really where we are. So that's the nice thing about coming onto the NHLA as a new executive director is I'm coming in at a great time where you're looking at the strategic plan. We've got a staff that's being functional, and doing a lot of good. And so I'm coming in and I get a chance to really analyze the staff, look at all the options, and analyze the membership and see where things are at and what types of memberships are available and what we can do to increase that. I get a look at the committees and see their functionality and maybe help to figure out how to get more buy-in and participation so that the committees are doing what needs to be done and making proper recommendations to the board of directors. And of course, you know, I really am gonna put this all together into a report with the next NHLA meeting to share the results and to come up with action items and really start to look at the strategic plan a little bit more and hope to start to do that with my executive committee call earlier today. There was a clear desire to get this strategic plan committee put together. So if you're interested in being on the strategic plan committee, please reach out to John Hester and myself to uh, have some more defined plan by August so that they can be discussed and put things together. So that even by September, we just have the questions worked out a little bit more and we have some parts together. Uh, this is a long-term process. This isn't something you just sprint up. You don't sprint up Mount Hood. You take your time to build up and to get there. Slow and steady wins the pace.
all the boy scouts would run ahead of me and be like, oh, you guys are so slow. But I'd catch them every time as they sat there out of breath. So I know exactly what it takes to get up that long haul mountain. And that's really what we need to think. We need to think about long haul, right? And that's why the members need to speak up and be heard. You know, we need to talk about our issues. I've been going around talking with members. And when I talk to them, the first question I ask most of the members is, what don't you want to be doing 50 years from now? And what do you want to be doing 50 years from now that you're not doing? And you sit there and think, well, what does that mean? And I'll give you a great example. You know, how long have we been taking a, a trailer that's going international shipments and you take it and you take your lumber and you load it this way and you have to shove it in with your forklift and doing all that effort to get that in there. You know, but when we have something going on a rail car, we have the curtain and the side loaders or the curtain loaders for some of our domestic stuff. And you just, oh, great. We can load it just like that. You know, how often are we going to sit there and tackle these problems or live with something just because that's the way we've always done it. We need to really be thinking ahead, speaking up and being heard about issues that you face so that we as an association can say, oh yeah, that's common. That's an issue other people face too. And if we all face this common issue, then maybe we can work together for the common good to address it. So that's really what we're here. Any questions you have on grading, membership, promotion, business, operations, anything like that, we can sit there and support those questions. Hey, Dallin, we do have um, a question. Um, just probably because you haven't seen it, I'll just tell you that there um, are a lot of people who are um, giving you um, support for your loss and wishing you, you know, condolences. Um, someone has missed your cell phone number, but I think you have that on a slide coming up or in the past, or you could just say it right now, or I could just put it in the chat. It's in the last slide, throw it in the chat and I'll, it's all showed on the last slide. Okay. Um, so one of the questions is, what do you see or forecast for hardwoods? Oh. And it, yeah, I think that kind of goes with, they have another question that is things um, have been good, but obviously there's a concern of, you know, the softening of the market. Absolutely. And, that, and that's what I see in forecast for hardwoods. Let me just tell you. It's going to go up and it's going to come down and it's going to go up and it's going to come down and it's going to go up and it's going to come down. And how prepared are we for that, right? Both as businesses and as an association. And I think one of the things that we need to talk about on that front is understanding that when the lumber prices are going down, you know, what's usually going up? And that's the infrastructure stuff, right? The ties and things like that. Because we saw that in 2008, if you, as the lumber prices crashed down, and the government looked to do more spending on infrastructure, they gave a lot of money to the railroads and others, and they did a lot more work with ties. And so I think what I see for the future of hardwoods is a stronger connection between our industrial products and our graded products. I'm not saying that one is better than the other. I'm saying they're both necessary. There's always going to be a low grade. There's always going to be a low quality. And we need to make sure that we have a better handle on what's going on with our products and where that's going so that we can be better prepared to handle those ups and downs a little bit more. That commodity, right? Those industrial products, pallets and ties are a critical part of what we do. And you might not do it in your business, but it's a matter of making sure you understand that it's there as an option and there's needs for it. So that's what I see going forward is a better connection with our infrastructure, ties, pallets, and I'm sure I'm missing other infrastructure. And again, I haven't been through everything, but the flooring and the cabinets and all those furniture, critical. I'm not trying to dismiss any of those needs at all. Those are critical needs that are going to continue. I think we'll see a shift back towards carbon sequestration ideas, which means more credits, more government spending on helping to be green. We're seeing that already. And when that comes, wood is going to come out ahead. We're going to be the main focus for those types of things. There's another question that um, someone is stating that basically one of their concerns, and we all know this because it's it's rampant, I think not just in our industry, but everywhere, is um, they're having a problem with help, especially with their sawyers, their edgers, their trimmer people. Um, really, those are skilled labor positions, um, maintenance and lumber graders and kiln operators. You know, labor is just difficult for people all the way around. Absolutely. And that's not going away. You know, we wish we could handle all those problems and have those people show up, especially because I've been out touring mills and I've yet to see a sawmill in a downtown location where there's lots of labor force available, you know, on the street corners. You know, if somehow for some reason they're all out in the woods in the middle of nowhere, 
Uh, I'm in Clearfield, Pennsylvania, and I know Brant and some of the other guys are in this area, but there is a Walmart here, right? That's the good news. <laughs> the bad news is there's not much else. So we really are going to continually face labor shortages. And I think we'll see more technology investment from the members, more consolidation. Uh, the softwood side of things has gone through some of this. And I think I've seen that. And so I can bring some of that perspective where you have membership consolidation, where you have increased automation. You know, the softwood guys aren't pulling off the chain anymore. And more and more, I think the hardwood guys are going to have to start to do bin sorting and other things like that so that you're not pulling off that chain with manual labor. Now, I appreciate the muscles I got doing that when I was a kid, but it's harder and harder to find kids willing to do that type of work. And now it's harder and harder to hold on to those type of people. You need them in more critical areas. You need them to be doing kiln operation or grading or other high skilled jobs. So I think we're gonna see more automation. The other thing I think we're gonna see more is concerns for the environment, really. the long-eared bat and those kind of things. Those aren't going away. The softwood industry faced that years ago with the spotted owl, and they will shrink the amount of allowable cut. It's going to happen. And we're all going to have to continue to push back and try to make sure that we have the ability to continue to harvest trees. There is a disconnect out there. People in the urban and rural communities, and I would say urban more than the rural, don't understand. Ur urban and suburban communities is what I want to say. Don't understand the connection between how long a tree will live. I saw a study once from the University of Minnesota that asked people how long a tree would live. And they'd say, I think 80% said until you cut it down. And they don't understand the gypsy moth and these other diseases and all the stuff that happens to the trees and storms and other things that, and forest fires, right? Trees don't live forever. There is a finite lifespan. The force is always dynamic and changing and we need to help people to understand that. And, and that's why I think this slide here that I have is, is important because allied associations and academics are key to helping us do this, right? The NHLA is not alone. We need to work with state and regional associations. We need to make sure that we continue to be the voice of the industry and include others in our voice. Uh, Renee and I are talking about that, how to get more people from the regional associations to participate with the hardwood matters and other things like that, to get your voice out there, to give you information you need to help your business, to make sure that we're communicating with you. Uh, there are lots of other national associations around there that we work with, that we have like-minded issues and we need to help preach to them. And I'm talking about to the choir, you know, the manufacturing associations or other wood associations or other things to say, hey, give us a chance to be part of this and help us to tell our story so that they can tell their story because it's a good story. The manufacturing story is a great story. Well, of course we have our good coalitions with the Real American Hardwood and uh, Hardwood Federation and other things like that. And I don't think those are gonna um, go away, but they're gonna struggle. The Hardwood Coalition, the Real American Hardwood Coalition is gonna struggle and we need to make sure as an NHLA, we continue to support it long-term and come up with long-term plans for supporting our associations. I always think that there's going to be the need to support consumer education, which is real American hardwood, but there's just general knowledge that needs to be shared that the NHLA needs to continue to do to help people understand our industry and find those ways to do it. You know, and this goes back to what I said before, have you thought about what you want to do differently in 50 years? Really, those are the types of things that we need to fill this paper up with when it comes to what changes we want to make and how we want to do things differently for your business, what you need to do to be automation or to handle labor issues. You know, if there's a labor shortage today, do you think it's gonna get better in 50 years? It's not likely. It's more likely that we're gonna to continue to face it. And so what do we need to do? How can we change and simplify things? How can we make sure that the NHLA and the grading rules and everything are incorporated into that? You know, Electronic grading and other things are things that we need to pay attention to as an industry. Well, there's my, the last slide and there's my cell phone number on there. And really, I hope that sort of give you a feel for what I love, my passions, the common ground that we have. I look forward to learning about each of you, your businesses, what you need from the NHLA, and drawing together a strong, cohesive unit where we can really help people working together for the good of the entire industry realize what we do and how we are the best environmental answer to the problems out there. We are the best manufacturing answer to products out there. So thank you very much for your time. Down, I want to I want to say real quick. Number one, thanks for all that. Um, <clears throat> but number two, I want to talk to the 
the attendees of this is knowing Dallin, well, met Dallin again, what, 12 years ago, but uh, knowing him now for a month, it's not empty words when he says that he wants to hear from you. He wants to hear ideas. He wants to hear what's wrong. Um, you know, so use his email and uh, he, he's energetic and, and is motivated. So shoot him those emails. A lot of people are wanting to ask questions now, but may not, but yeah, if you'd rather do that individually, you can, but if there's anything we can address today, you know, you have a captive audience, so you might want to take advantage of it now. I like to think that I'm young and impressionable. I, I know I have some gray hair up there, but that's because of the kids, not because of the age. <laughs> okay, well, everybody seems to be very quiet. So we're kind of- As committees are, which means you all agree with me, which means we're going to do it my way. Oh. Here you go. <laughs> got a question. Amy Shields has a has a comment that I think everybody uh, has seen, but um, somebody wants to know what do you know about would I? Oh, I've got a different one. Yep. So, John, you may want to explain that one to Dallin. I don't know if Dallin has seen that yet. No. It, it, is this, I don't see that one. Are they talking about Wood Eye technology? The, yeah, like the exactly. grading. No. Yeah. I mean, we as the NHLA need to look into all these options and discuss them. I don't know Wood Eye specifically in terms of pluses and minuses. I've heard of them before. But yeah, these are the types of things where we need to get these types of guys to show up this technology off at our convention and trade shows. And John is working very hard to get all of these equipment providers there and make sure that they're able to give you something to help you understand how they can simplify your business. And it's not a replacement, it's a complement. You know, the Wood Eye and whatever other names of technologies, and I think there's three out there, they're not competition with our graders, they're complements. Yeah, you have to know the grades if you're gonna operate um, and, use, and use the equipment. Um, Amy Shields has a question and um, I'm gonna comment on it and then Dallin, you can comment. She is saying, um, as the hardwood mass timber CLT building materials become part of our future, um, we need to expand the grading to include structural grading. And how do you see NHLA participating in that? Um, I think that one of the things I can comment and then Dallin can come behind me is, um, we have been working closely um, with Henry Casada and academics regarding this hardwood um, CLT, they are working with the, and John, you may have to help me because Dana Spessert's not on here, with the code and... Got it, code. Yep. <laughs> um, the code people who talk about building construction, um, that has to be, hardwood CLT has to be put into that um, and we are involved with that process and Dana Spesser specifically as our chief inspector is being involved in that. So how we continue to participate will be put over onto Dallin and I guess I'm assuming part of our strategic plan. So I'll let you talk about that then. Yeah, CLT is a good question. And the funny thing is I had a chance to get involved with CLT years ago and I chose thermal modification instead. So <laughs> I don't know if that was the right move or not, but I, it was a good move. And CLT has got a lot of potential. It's going to change the way we do our large buildings, multifamily housing and other construction in the United States. You know, I once had a consultant, not a consultant, I once had a, a keynote speaker come to a, the WWPI meeting and he said the biggest innovation we've had in the home building industry since the beginning of time is the pneumatic nail gun. He's like, and that's it, that's it. He's like, what else do we do? You know, stick frame construction, that's the only innovation we've got is the, is the nail gun. And we need more innovation. We need more prefab. We need more other things like that. And so CLT will fit that niche and create an opportunity there. And so we will see more CLT. Now, the grading rules, and actually, I, good news is I have a lot of code experience because I've sat on code committees for the preserved wood industry and for the fire retardant treated wood industry. And I can tell you about grading rules in terms of structural grading and CLT and the building codes. We will see building codes accept those grading rules as they get done. Right now, the American Lumber Standards Committee, ALSC, does have standards for a number of hardwoods in there, and there are, is the potential for that. But there's always gonna be people who are pushing low grade buzzwords or other things like that. Let me be clear about hardwood CLT grading. You know, 
it's going to have to compete with softwoods and softwoods are typically cheaper. So we already got to compete with the strong market that's already looking for something cheaper. It's also not going to be your low grades. So you're not going to see CLT get all your naughty waney wood. It doesn't work that way because the CLT industry, when they did that in softwoods, put in the naughty grainy wood. And what they do is they'd, they'd have multiple layers and they do a fire test. And what they'd find is that the naughty grainy wood weighing in it would create what they call char fall off where once the uh, lumber, once the CLT started to burn, and it got to the next layer, the char layer would, and the glue would fail and it'd fall off and that next layer would be exposed and that knot and waney stuff would create more fire hazard. And so it didn't improve the fire performance. And so what they ended up doing is going to high grade in the core and on the outside and you're like all high grade. Well, we didn't need more uses for a high grade. We need uses for our low grade. I do think it'll happen. I think we'll see some low grade CLT structures. I think we'll see some appearance surface so that you might have even the mixtures where those hardwoods are on the outside because it's a better appearance product for a CLT. Those types of things will be done, but there is going to be issues that we have to look at. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? Alan got a few well wishers again and people that want to meet you in Cleveland. So I can say again, uh, I can, I can guarantee you that Dallin will be in the exhibit hall and, uh, and wanting to shake people's hands. So Chris, he'll be by your booth. I'll be walking around. So for sure, I will get by and, and see everybody as best I can. And please take the time to say hi to me. Tell me what you do. Tell me what the NHL brings to you. How do we help you? And how can we help you more? Okay. And on that great ending, if no one has anything else for Dallin, we will sign off. I'm saying it slowly, just in case there's anybody that's got that last minute thing that they want to put in here. Remind, every, remind everyone about our uh, webinar next week. Yes, um, we have our Advocacy 101 next week um, <clears throat> that will um, be headed up and led by um, the Hardwood Federation Executive Director, Dana Cole. We hope that you will um, jump on and participate, please. Um, the November 8th elections are going to be very important uh, for your industry and for the country. So as much information as we can give you to help you with that and talk to your representatives, the better. Um, and if you have not signed up for the convention, this is your chance to do so now. Um, you're going to want to see Dallin in person and meet him and talk to him and have the opportunity to express your concerns or your, your optimism for what's coming in the future. So um, I guess the next time we will see most of you will be in person in Cleveland. So thank you, everybody, for jumping on board. Yes, um, we will put this presentation um, out on the website. It'll be part of our webinar listings that are um, that are on the website. So it'll be easily to get to and check out later if you want to share it with anybody who wasn't on the call today. Okay, okay, all right. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Dallin. Thank you, appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time to listen, get a chance to meet me. Enjoy the weather in, in uh, Pennsylvania, Dallin. You gotta come <laughs> home eventually. It did rain today, so you're, that is good. It did rain, but it's over now. But it did rain here in Memphis. Oh, good. Right. I will see you on Monday when I get back from Canada. All right. Bye, Safe travels. Yep. Bye, Thank everybody. You.